video will examine adult learning history in Canada from 1915 to 1939, an era in which we began to see universities provide extension programs to adults. The Antigonish Movement, Workers' Educational Association, and the Banff School of Fine Arts will be explored. During this video, please reflect on the following analysis questions. What factors led to the emergence of the Antigonish Movement? How did the Workers' Educational Association originate, and what was their main goal? What was the objective of the Banff School of Fine Arts, and what impact did it have on nation-building in Canada? The Antigonish Movement was a program of adult education, self-help, and cooperative development that arose in eastern Nova Scotia in the 1920s. It was based at the Extension Department of St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, under the leadership of Rev. Jimmy Tompkins and Dr. Moses Cody. The Antigonish movement arose in response to the poverty afflicting farmers, fishers, miners, and other disadvantaged groups in eastern Canada. The movement focused on adult education as a means towards social improvement and economic organization. Typically, one of the movement's organizers would enter a community and call a public meeting to assess the community's strengths and difficulties. A study club would be created where farmers, fishermen, and miners could come together to learn about their economic situation and learn strategies for pulling themselves out of poverty. Education revolved around an understanding of the local economy, innovative farming techniques, and the potential of cooperation. Usually one or more cooperatives would be established to help overcome the difficulties that had been discussed during the study circles. The credit union was the most common, but the movement also organized cooperatives for selling fish, retailing consumer goods, building homes, and marketing agricultural produce. This formula of collective learning and economic self-reliance rapidly produced a noticeable impact. During the 1930s, the number of study clubs increased from 179 to 1,300, and the number of participants in these clubs from 1,500 to 11,000. The number of credit unions from 8 to 170, and the number of cooperative organizations from 2 to 85. In spite of the customs and traditions of the time, women were active participants in the process. The philosophic principles of the Antigonish movement were well established as guidelines for the work of the movement in the 1920s and 30s. However, it wasn't until 1944 that they were formally articulated by Professor Harry Johnson, who developed six principles which were later endorsed by Dr. Cody. The principles included the primacy of the individual, social reform must come through education, Education must begin with the economic. Education must be through group action. Effective social reform involves fundamental changes in social and economic institutions. And the ultimate objective of the movement is a full and abundant life for everyone in the community. The Antigonish movement is universally accepted as a significant Canadian contribution to the theory and practice of social change. In 1959, after Cody's death, St. Francis Xavier University created the Cody International Institute to train adult educators from developing countries based on the theories and practices of the Antigonish movement. In the following decades, more than 22,000 people attended courses and seminars organized by the Institute in order to study the Antigonish approach to adult education and to find ways to apply it to their own communities. Today, the Cody International Institute continues to promote democratically based and locally organized grassroots cooperative action in many parts of the world. The Workers' Educational Association Association, an offshoot of the British Workers' Educational Association, was founded in Canada in 1917 as part of the University of Toronto's extension program. It was meant to provide a link between labour and learning by making higher education available to the working class. At the time, there was a need for educational opportunities for working class adults. The Mechanics Institute had long since disappeared, public libraries offered educational resources but few classes, and the university extension programs provided only expensive courses. Therefore, the purpose of the WEA was to provide a general education with the idea that this liberal education would improve workers' overall lives. It offered courses on subjects such as economics, current events, labor history, and collective bargaining. Central to the WEA's educational offerings were tutorial classes, public debates, summer programs, radio programs, and a film library. In the early to mid-1920s, Windsor, Hamilton, and Ottawa all started local chapters of the WEA. The 1930s saw an increase in greater diversity in the types of trade union membership. By the 1940s, there were 24 associations across Ontario, which Toronto established as the Strong Centre. However, by 1942, the WEA was cut out of the University of Toronto's budget. By the late 1940s, the WEA's funding problems increased, and many in the organization's executive were accused of being communists, despite the WEA's published constitution that described the organization as politically nonpartisan. In the 1950s, the Canadian political scene saw a rise in union affiliation and a decline in interest and support of the WEA. 
In 1933, the University of Alberta Department of Extension received a grant from the U.S.-based Carnegie Corporation to build a fine arts program. Under the leadership and guidance of director Ned Corbett, the Banff School of Drama began with a single two-week drama program with 190 participants. In 1936, creative writing, playwriting, and painting were added to the school, which was now called the Banff School of Fine Arts, and was led by Donald Cameron, Corbett's successor. As the year passed, the variety of courses grew to include ceramics, French immersion, weaving, dance, opera, and photography. Conference programs were introduced in 1953 and leadership programs in 1954. After World War II, the Banff School was exploited as an endeavor to promote Canadian nation building and national culture. The aim was to create an academic and cultural icon that would distinguish Canada as a progressive and sovereign entity. Donald Cameron envisioned the Banff Centre as having a reputation equivalent to the leading educational institutions of the world, such as Oxford and Cambridge. He expected the school to raise the standards of cultural education by training adults who would then go home as cultural producers with enhanced skills to foster community arts leadership. The Canadian government shared this vision and in 1946 commissioned the National Film Board to produce a film to promote global awareness of the Banff Centre. The film was entitled Holiday at School and it gained international attention and brought the universal acknowledgement that both Cameron and the Canadian government desired. This recognition was significant in building national citizenship in the post-war era and bolstering Canada's cultural reputation in the world arena. In 1970, to acknowledge the greater educational role the school had taken on, the name was changed to the BAMP Centre for Continuing Education. The Alberta government granted the BAMP Centre full autonomy as a non-degree granting institution in 1978. In 1996, the BAMP Centre opened a conference facility, and the same year, the centre's fourth division, Mountain Culture Programming, was created. Today, the BAMP Centre is recognized globally as a leader in creative business, arts, and environmental studies. They continue to offer a full range of programs in the performing, literary, new media, and visual arts, in leadership development, and mountain culture as well as their world-class conference facility. Please reflect on the following synthesis questions. What lasting impacts can be seen in Eastern Canada from the Antigonish movement today? What led to the demise of the Workers' Educational Association in Canada? And do you think that the BAMP Centre achieved its mission of distinguishing Canada as a progressive and sovereign entity?